Hello, fellow Algonquin Park lovers, and welcome to Algonquin Defining Moments. In this podcast, I'm going to share a few highlights of the human history of Canoe Lake in Algonquin Park. Located about 14 kilometers in from the West Gate, and unbeknownst to most, Canoe Lake has a deep and colorful history, well beyond the Tom Thompson Memorial Cairn and Totem Pole and the Canoe Lake Cemetery. In this podcast, I'd like to share the highlights of about a dozen landmarks around the lake. For most, you'll have to use your imagination, as little, if anything, remains. First, we'll start with our launching spot on Portage Bay, which is the home of the Portage Store. Then we'll head north up the lake to a few notable sites mid-lake, including Brock's Lighthouse, the Tom Thompson Memorial Cairn and Totem Pole, and the Whiskey Jack Creek. Then we'll paddle to the north end and head to Joe Lake Dam and investigate landmarks that are no longer there, including Joe Lake Station, the Algonquin Hotel, and Colson Store. Then we'll backtrack and head up Potter's Creek and check out the remains of the Trestle Bridge and Omanique Sawmill as well as Canoe Lake Station and the Canoe Lake School. Then we'll head back down the lake and end with a view of the former town of Mowat and Mowat Lodge on the northeastern shore. So, let's start with our launching spot. On a typical Saturday or Sunday during the height of the summer season, it is estimated that over a thousand visitors a day might pass through the south end of Canoe Lake and visit the Portage Store, which is here on their left-hand side. For some, it's to collect their rented canoes and equipment from the Portage Store Outfitting Department and get their permit from the park access point in order to venture off north or south into the interior. For others, it's to stop to admire the Tom Thompson dedication plaque that overlooks the water, or have a meal in the Portage Store restaurant and a visit to the gift shop on their way through the park. For another group of visitors, it's an opportunity in relative safety to experiment with one of Canada's most enduring pastimes, that of paddling a canoe. The Pea Store, as the locals call it, has sat on this site since 1936, just before the opening of Highway 60. Established by Molly Colson and her husband Ed, owners of the Algonquin Hotel at the north end of the lake, near the railway line, in its original confirmation, the Portage store was really just a large cabin. It had a long set of stairs that ran up the front to a little veranda. There was a small addition at the back containing an ice-filled meat locker. In the center of the main room was a pot-bellied stove that kept the place warm during storms or cold weather in the spring and fall. The walls were lined with shelves full of the basic supplies such as sugar, flour, and tea. Orders for fresh food were taken weekly and delivered the following week. Originally managed by Joe Cousineau, the Pea Store was the social center of the south end of the lake. In 1939, the Colsons retired and ownership was transferred to Basil Hughes and his brother who built up the canoe trip outfitting business as more people were arriving by car and using Portage Bay as their access point rather than the Canoe Lake Station. In 1950, the brothers in turn sold the lease to a music teacher, Hilda Cap, and her accountant brother-in-law, Cardwell Walker. She tried to get approval from the government to upgrade the facilities to include gas pumps, a gift shop, and a place to serve sit-down sandwiches and coffee. In this, she was unsuccessful. So she sold the lease to the group of Janie Roberts, Isabel Cowie, Marge McCowell, and Fran Smith. These four became known by the locals as the ladies who ran the Portage store. Introduced to Algonquin Park by Frank Brock, who we will talk about a little later, the four friends from 1955 to 1957 rented out canoes, sold groceries, and began the tradition of selling ice cream and massive amounts of ice cream to local cottagers, canoe trippers, and visiting tourists. By 1958, after three summers of backbreaking work, the group of friends were tired out. It was also becoming apparent that the new government policy put in place in 1954 of not renewing leases meant that the department would now be exerting far more control over commercial activities in the park. Unbeknownst to them, the department had in fact decided that the Portage Store property needed to be acquired and replaced with a more modern building to be managed on a concession, not a lease basis. The ladies were bought out and the old store was torn down and a new structure, what you see today, was built. It was ready for business in 1960 with Ken Simpson from Toronto set up as the concessionaire with all of the accoutrements that Hilda Cap had tried in vain to get approved a decade earlier. A few years later, Simpson requested and got approval for a new kind of Algonquin experience, namely the Tom Thompson Memorial Boat Tour. An instant success, the tour became a major tourist attraction for quite a number of years. 
Originally a wooden cruiser, the boat would take a dozen or so tourists on an hour-long, 16-mile trip. It would cruise north up the lake, past the Tom Thompson Totem Pole and Cairn, then down the west side of the lake and through the Bonita Narrows to South Tea Lake and back. This same route would take place five to six times a day at about a dollar a person. Later, the cruiser was replaced with the Miss Algonquin Park, a glass-topped, hundred-passenger, all-weather steel vessel imported from service at the Toronto Islands and Lake Ontario. In 1969, it allegedly carried close to 24,000 people. Though a great generator of tourist dollars, the Miss Algonquin had a significant environmental impact on Canoe Lake as it ran on diesel fuel and generated a very large wake. Over the years, the wake did a fair bit of damage to leaseholder docks, retaining walls, and sections of shoreline all along its route. Eventually, as the water quality on Canoe Lake, and especially in Portage Bay, got poorer and poorer, complaints got louder and louder. With new regulations intending to return the park to a more natural state, contributing to the Miss Algonquin's demise in 1973. After the 1975 summer season, a discouraged Simpson decided not to request a renewal of his concession, and it was opened for tender. That fall, Eric Micklin and his younger brother Sven took over the concession, and the family still manages it today. Now, over 45 years later, best guess is that in any one season, there are anywhere from 75 to 100,000 visitors passing through the Canoe Lake area. About 40% are day paddlers, and the rest venture into the interior for multi-day trips. Now, paddling up the east shore of the lake, the first landmark that you come to is a lighthouse located just north of a little island called Popcorn Island. Built by Frank Brock with the help of a crew of Boy Scouts in 1944. Atop the lighthouse was once a hand-woven Victrola turntable. It was mounted and adjusted in such a way that one full winding would turn the table for 26 hours. A rectangular box of red and clear glass was installed on the top of the turntable into which a small coal oil lamp was inserted. This enabled the lighthouse to emit light all night long, alternating bright white and red. In later years, this was replaced by a battery-powered intermittent flashing light. Though the light no longer works, local residents maintain the monument with support from the Canoe Lake and District Leaseholders Association. Frank, who lived in a cottage nearby, was born in Nebraska in 1878. Educated at the University of Michigan, he migrated to Canada in 1913 and eventually settled at Guelph Collegiate where he taught vocational subjects until his retirement in 1949. Frank was a world traveler, visiting China, Mexico, and Japan at a time when very few North Americans ever ventured far from home. As a, at an older boys' conference in 1917, he heard a speech by Taylor Statton, founder of Camp Amic, and became inspired to join the Camp Amic staff, which he did in 1925. From then on, he spent most of his summers on Canoe Lake, eventually getting a lease and settling on this point in 1934. Frank was a master craftsman. He built a unique fireplace on whose front face he mounted two iron thunderbirds with eyes allegedly made from gold nuggets. He handmade all of the furniture, including a white pine table that was polished to a dark walnut finish. Around the edge of the table, he carved a story using Navajo Indian symbols. He handmade two large chairs with backs carved into the shape of two-headed thunderbirds so that they could look out both sides of the chair. Frank would only invite to visit people whom he considered the right sort for Algonquin Park. All his guests were expected to help with various chores around the place, including once sometimes standing up to their waists in water hauling out driftwood. According to his friends, he didn't want them to go soft. After he'd retired from teaching in the camps, he stayed at Canoe Lake from early spring until late fall. Frank was also a poet, and he would hand draw his Christmas cards each year using blueprint paper. He also wrote the commemorative poem that can be found at the Tom Thompson totem pole. Frank died in 1968, and in the fall of 1976, his cabin, Kesamia, was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. All that remains on the site today is the ruined shell of a small ice house and the stone fireplace. Continuing on up the lake, past the islands that housed Camp Wapameo from the Taylor Staten camps, you'll see in the distance on what is called Hayhurst Point a glimpse of the Tom Thompson Memorial Cairn and Totem Pole. During the years that Tom Thompson painted on Canoe Lake, which was from 1912 to 1917, he would frequently stay across the way at Mowat Lodge. However, from time to time the hustle and bustle of the lodge and tourists would become too much, 
so he would escape to this high ridge to camp for a few days. After his death, a group of his fellow artists, knowing of his love for this location, established a stone memorial cairn on the site. On a bronze plaque, W. W. Alexander engraved the epitaph composed by J. E. H. MacDonald, a founding member of the Group of Seven and a long-standing friend. In 1930, Taylor Statton, known as the Chief, founder and owner of Camp Amok on the northeast side of the lake, spearheaded the creation of a commemorative totem pole that was erected next to the Tom Thompson Cairn. Though not native to the area, the totem pole became a landmark and an immediate tourist attraction on the lake. Decades later, in 1959, with the support of the Canoe Lake and District Leaseholders Association, nearby resident George Hayhurst rebuilt the stone cairn. Frank Brock added the commemorative poem describing the totem's figures and their meaning, which was then framed and attached to the totem pole. A rededication ceremony was held that August. Today, the site is also maintained by the cooperative efforts of the Canoe Lake and District Leaseholders Association, local neighbors, and park officials. Next, let's head west across the lake to Whiskey Jack Creek. It's unclear what the origins of the name are, as it's actually known as a premier spot for moose sighting, not Whiskey Jacks. In early morning or late afternoon, you can often find moose at the north end, northwest end of the creek. Locals call it Adaskin's Bay, after Murray Adaskin and his wife Frances, who owned a lease close by. Murray was a renowned Canadian violinist, composer, conductor, and teacher, and Frances a soprano vocalist who used to practice her scales off the end of their dock. Back in the day when there was little concern for the environment, the eastern entrance to Whiskey Jack Creek was the location of a massive garbage dump. According to reports at the time, the smell was horrific and the water around the entry to the creek was contaminated. Leaseholder complaints in the mid-30s led to its closing and the migration of the dump to Sims Pits a sandy area north of Ghost Walk Creek at the top north end of the lake. Eventually, with the 1974 master plan, all garbage was either trucked out of the park or taken to special sites at various access points. Though fully overgrown now, bushwhacking through the trees on the east side of the creek can uncover the occasional artifact. Farther along the south side of the creek, at one time could be found the remains of the wooden Camp Amic pirate ship, which was scuttled there in the 1970s. It has long ago decomposed and the location returned to nature. When reaching the far shore, the creek narrows, and it is here where both moose can be seen and as well is a leaseholder-maintained loon raft. Originally built in the 1980s, the raft is used by loons as a nesting site in the spring. Though not used every year, it protects the nest from washout when the water levels vary as they typically do in the spring. Also on the west shore, if one were to bushwhack directly west, Approximately 300 yards in, you'll come to what was once a clear-cut meadow that housed a stable for the teams of horses that were used to haul logs to the mill. Though overground now, with the trunks of many fallen trees, the occasional ancient artifact can be found from the earliest logging days. Now let's head back north up the lake and take the Joe Lake Arm to Joe Lake Dam, where we'll have an opportunity to go back in time to when Tom Thompson was a fixture on the lake. At the head of Canoe Lake, paddlers must veer to the right, and after a short portage around Joe Lake Dam, another short paddle will take you to a bridge. Standing on the bridge, looking to the west, is where Joe Lake Station used to be. Way up on the hill was Algonquin Hotel, with the Colson store down by the shore. Looking to the east, across the bridge, was once the location of Mark Robinson's cabin. Now, of course, none of these landmarks exist today. They were all taken down back in the 50s, but just a bit of history. In the late 1890s, J.R. Booth, one of Canada's most famous lumbermen, decided to build the Ottawa Arn Prayer and Perry Sound Railway from Perry Sound on Depot Harbour at Georgian Bay through Scotia Junction on the west side of the park to Whitney on the east side and eventually to Ottawa. Along the route in 1896, five key stations were established, namely Rock Lake Station, Algonquin Station at, Ca at Cash Lake, where the park headquarters was, Brule Station, Canoe Lake Station, and Joe Lake Station. By 1904, Booth deemed the railway to be unprofitable and sold it to the Grand Trunk Railway. His timing was terrible, as within a few years of the sale, his railway line became a commercial gateway to markets in the United States. This meant that large numbers of freight trains used the line carrying goods, grain, and other products to and from points east and west. 
During the railway line's heyday, sometimes the engineers and conductors would let the local kids jump on the train at Joe Lake Station and ride the train to Canoe Lake Station. There they would jump off and walk back up the track to Joe Lake Station again after getting ice cream from the Colsons at their store. If there was a medical emergency, there was a little gas rail car which would be used to go out along the track to the Red Cross Hospital in Whitney. From these beginnings and its proximity to the Algonquin Hotel, Joe Lake Station became the social center for the district at that time. The big excitement on a Saturday night would be a square dance organized in the train station waiting room. It would be attended by workers from the local mills, guests from the local hotels, and the local summer residents. One canoe tripping visitor recalled having to sleep on the bare floor in the nearby baggage storeroom. Next door, the local square danced up such a storm that the trippers were bounced up and down each time the heavy booted feet stomped on the loose floorboards. Dancing, it seemed, was a serious business. Seeing the growing interest in visiting the wilderness, Lawrence Merrill from Rochester, New York, established the Hotel Algonquin in 1908 and in 1917 sold it to Ed and Molly Colson, who had previously been managing the Highland Inn at Cache Lake. The Algonquin Hotel had about 20 rooms, two big screened-in porches, and three bathrooms shared by all the guests. There were various wood stoves that would be lit when it got a little cool in early spring or late fall. Each bedroom was equipped with a nice washstand with pitcher, oil lamps for late-night reading, iron or wooden beds, and nice wooden dressers. In the kitchen was a big wood-burning range that was unbearable to cook on in the summer, but a great generator of heat during the rest of the year. The outside was made of a custom-cut wood slabs, and the Algonquin tended to attract patrons who enjoyed roughing it, at least a little bit. Guests would usually come for a month and spend time picnicking, hiking, swimming, or fishing on the lake or in the local area. Over time, it became a favorite place to launch fishing trips into the interior of the park. Next to the hotel, the Colsons established the Joe Lake Outfitting Store, known as the Colson Store by the locals, to offer canoe tripping guides and outfitting. According to longtime guide Ralph Bice, in its heyday, the Colson Store was the best outfitting store in the park. Ed's sister, Annie Colson, known as Aunt Annie, by everyone, ran it. Though somewhat severe looking, Annie Colson was well loved by all. As Bice went on to say, Annie could set up a list of supplies as well as most guides. People would call or write in their tip tripping orders before they came up. She would pack all their flour, rice, and whatever else they wanted in cotton bags. The eggs were packed into pails, and along with tents and blankets were packed into pack sacks. No one had sleeping bags in those days. The hotel was open from early May until the end of September. By the mid-1940s, room rates at the hotel were $28 per week, including meals. Buying breakfast or lunch separately was $0.75, cents, and dinner was a dollar, according to Eleanor Mooney Wright, who lived for a number of years in the ranger cabin across Joe Creek from the hotel. Her father, George, was the local park ranger. This all meant that Colson store was a busy and popular meeting place for all sorts, including guests, guides, leaseholders, and staff from the children's camps. There was always some reason to stop by. Most wanted to get supplies at the Colson store, talk to the guides or to Ed Colson, or just generally hang around. In 1943, the Colsons retired to an empty Omanique Lumber Company office near the northwest side of Water Creek, Trestle Bridge, and sold the hotel to George Marydew, owner of a tavern in Toronto. Marydew became a fixture on the lake for many years, but in 1957 he sold the hotel to Bruce and Astrid Street. To the new owner's surprise and horror, the next year the government condemned and expropriated it and its road rights and tore it down in 1959. All that was left was the piano, which made its way to a leaseholder cabin on Canoe Lake, where it still resides. Though originally hired to patrol the park in pairs in search of poachers, park rangers over time became the local administrators of park regulations. They lived in small one-room cabins, which dotted the park interior. A few still survive and can be rented through the park's permit reservation system. One of the most famous and most hard-working of park rangers was Mark Robinson. Mark joined the park staff in 1907, and except for a leave of absence from the fall of 1915 to the spring of 1917, Mark lived and worked from and around the shores of many Algonquin lakes for nearly 40 years. As shared by park resident Lyle Ireland in 1959, Mark worked as a ranger because he loved it. He told me once that he was an unusually lucky man because he was paid for doing what he loved to do. 
He wrote extensively and well about the park and its flora and fauna. Many of his articles illustrated by his own photographs appeared in the Globe, and I think in the old Saturday night. Mark served many years in the Cache Lake, Joe Lake, and Canoe Lake areas, and later at Brent on Cedar Lake. He was chief park ranger for a few years and was acting superintendent for one year. His knowledge of the park and everything in it was comprehensive and accurate, and he loved to talk about it. As department regulations prohibited families of park rangers living with them, Mark would travel to visit his wife and children in Barrie several times a year. It was only in later years that the family would come to the park to visit him for a few weeks during the summer. He'd faithfully mail his wife his paycheck every month and wrote letters weekly. What a lonely life it must have been for both of them. Now let's backtrack towards the main body of Canoe Lake and head up the west arm of what is known as Potter Creek. About a half mile up Potter Creek, all that remains of the trestle bridge are the few uprights and cross pieces in the middle of the creek. Remains of the Omanique sawmill can be found on the northwest side of the creek, about a hundred yards across a meadow into the forest, from a circular concrete base that then housed the sawdust burner and is now home to a large spruce tree. Lumbering in the area was revived in 1926 with the arrival of the Canoe Lake Lumber Company, which had taken over the Gilmore lumbering limits and built a sawmill at Potter Creek. Unsuccessful at cutting and milling hardwood profitably, these efforts were soon abandoned. In 1939, Joe Omanique tried to make a go of it again and for a few years was reasonably successful. But he too eventually abandoned his efforts and the site was returned to the Crown in late 1943. It was Amonique who built a road extension out to Highway 60 across the Trestle Bridge, the remains of which you can see today. Loggers from the Canoe Lake Lumber Company would cut logs in Smoke Lake all winter and in the spring would tow these hardwood logs up from Smoke Lake to the sawmill in 36-foot long cribs made of cedar logs. They used a 50-foot tugboat powered by a 40-horsepower single-cylinder steam engine that was fueled by wood slabs cut at the mill. The log booms were anchored from the Mowat Lodge waterfront all the way up to the front of the mill area up Potter Creek. In spring, after the ice went out, the Amonique Lumber Company would release into the lake the logs that had been cut during the winter and stacked up on the shores of Smoke Lake. The loggers would run the logs down Smoke Creek, then ferry them with barges across the end of South Tea Lake, up Bonita Narrows, and through Canoe Lake to the mill site on Potter Creek. There were often incredible log jams on shore where Tea Lake campgrounds are now. The loggers' bunkhouse and cook shack were on a barge and they used to tie it up at the low rock outcropping on Smoke Lake, just upstream from the bridge. During the mill's existence, the unsightly piles of cut lumber on the shoreline were of concern to residents of Canoe Lake. Once it closed down, the condition of the former mill site continued to raise the ire of everyone on the lake. Both lumber companies had promised to clear the site completely, but hadn't done so. In the 1960s, to resolve the problem, the ministry decided to plant spruce trees on the entire area, including not just the mill site, but all of the siding area as well. Today, this is all overgrown, and only by searching diligently can you find the remains of the two-story cement mill site that still stands among the spruce trees. Continuing on up Potter's Creek, the stream narrows and is now quite overgrown with alders. Eventually another bridge comes into view and you can climb up the sand bank and walk a little ways down the road. You'll be standing about where the Canoe Lake Station was built. A baggage chute was built to move luggage from the train down to the water's edge. And like a log flume, the baggage would fly down the hill to the dock to be loaded into boats or canoes that would be waiting at Creekside. It's been said that in the early 1900s, trains would pass every 20 minutes carrying grain from the west amongst other valuable cargo. Mrs. Rattan, the railway section boss's wife, was the first station mistress. She tried to keep the place clean and in a fit of pique one day posted a sign in the station waiting room which read, Gentlemen will not, ladies do not, and others must not spit on the floor. Edwin Thomas, the station master during the Thompson years, worked 10 hours a day earning $1.39 per hour running two sections. Short-staffed, he learned how to change a 72-pound yard rail by himself. His brother-in-law, Jack Wilkinson, quit grade school at the age of 13 and joined a local winter logging camp for $1.50 a day. As Rose Thomas recalled in a 1976 interview with Ron Pittaway, We lived in the Canoe Lake Station House. It had living quarters upstairs. We had to carry everything upstairs, wood, water, coal, and the stairs were crooked. The layout included four bedrooms, a big living room, and a big kitchen out back. 
The railroad office was downstairs with a big waiting room with slab seats that went all around three walls. Tom Thompson allegedly would place his paintings around the room to dry while he was waiting for the train. Somewhat difficult to find, the Canoe Lake Cemetery is located on a knoll just west of the main Mowat town site. Today it can be found by walking south on the former tote road to a spot a few hundred yards south of the open area where the chip yard used to be. A broken twig signals a path that leads the hiker through a meadow and then a short climb up to the site that is now surrounded by dense bush. Marked by a gray picket fence with an ancient birch tree sheltering the site, the cemetery's only occupant for many years was James Watson, who had died in 1897 in a mill accident. His fellow workers engraved the following inscription, now almost impossible to read. Remember, comrades, when passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. Prepare thyself to follow me. Later in 1915, a black throat diphtheria epidemic took the life of eight-year-old Alexander Hayhurst, son of a Canoe Lake resident, who was also buried there. According to research by Mary Garland in her book chronicling the history of the town of Mowat, George Martin, the 10-year-old son of a Fred Martin, also died of diphtheria and is also buried near the Watson grave. In 2011, Mary Garland, her husband, and Don Galna, son of Robert Galna, former Gilmore Lumber Company employee and caretaker of the site in the 1900s, and Mowat's postmaster from 1903 to 1907, decided to explore the site with witching rods. To their surprise, they found evidence of another four possible graves. Two are located beside and across from the birch tree, across from Watson's grave, and one on either side of the Alexander Hayhurst marker. One is likely Martin's grave, but the others are all unknown. She also speculates that other graves may well exist back into the bush to the north and west of the cemetery. The current fence was a new addition in the 1940s, so it is highly likely that there have been many more burials than the few that exist today. Now, let's head for our last two spots, the town of Mowat and the site of Mowat Lodge. Directly across the north end of the lake from the Tom Thompson Cairn are all that remains of the original town of Mowat. It's a few cottages on the shoreline. After the railway opened for business and Canoe Lake Station was established, David Gilmore, owner of the Delbor Lumber Company, decided that the northwest shore of Canoe Lake, so close to the rail line, might be the perfect place to build a saw and planing mill and town site. He named it for Oliver Mowat, who was Ontario's premier at the time. In 1892, Gilmore was granted a 10-year license of occupation for 326 acres south of the new railway line and west of Potter Creek for $40 a year. For its first few years, the Mowat site housed the original park headquarters as well. It was a simple log shanty with a hewn timber floor, a scoop log roof, bunks, chairs, and table for six with a sheet iron wood stove for heat and kerosene lanterns for light. According to the Canadian lumberman in May 1896, the new mill with its 80-foot high wood chip burner was expected to have with one bandsaw an annual capacity of 50 million board feet of lumber. The Dorset Tote Road was extended up the west side of Canoe Lake to the new town site. Nearby, a meadow was clear-cut and a stable built to house the many teams of horses needed to haul logs to the mill. The boiler for the mill was hauled along the tote road by nine teams of horses who dragged it over birch rollers that allegedly wore out almost as fast as the men could replace them. The construction workers worked three shifts per day to get Canoe Lake Mills ready for action in time for the spring log drive in 1897. The function of the mill was to prepare four-inch thick boards called deals that were then shipped out to Ottawa finishing mills. During those years, Canoe Lake would become a complete mass of floating logs. At its peak, over 500 people came to reside in the town that sprang up to encompass 32 buildings around the Gilmore Mill. These included blacksmith and carpentry shops, a 30,000-gallon water tank, a hospital with 10 rooms, two boarding houses, several barns and stables for 50 teams of horses, a large warehouse, cookhouse, various storehouses, farm buildings, shacks, and a small cemetery, as we discussed previously. A post office was established in 1897 with E.T. Marsh as the first postmaster. A 2.4-kilometer rail spur called the Gilmore Spur was built from the mill site to the main line at the Canoe Lake Station, with its water tank, pump house, and numerous sidings for the rail line. Unfortunately, in 1898, 
Prices for the white pine dropped so much that the Gilmores decided to stockpile most of the top grade lumber. In order to create a large enough storage area, sawdust, slabs, and inferior logs were dumped into the lake alongside the mill until it made a solid surface, which became known as the chipyard. By 1900, the whole logging scheme went bankrupt, and the Gilmores abandoned the area. Little effort was made to clean up the mess or return the area to its original condition as required by their license of occupation. By 1901, there were only 205 inhabitants. Some worked for the railway, some for the park, others for the Gilmore bankruptcy receiver. In 1906, the Gilmore receivers convinced the Ontario government to extend the Gilmore license of occupation for another five years to facilitate a more complete liquidation of the remaining assets. During those years, many of the better buildings, including the hospital, boarding house and kitchen, and various outbuildings were sold to arriving leaseholders. The rail spur was dismantled and the rail sold to Colonel J. Gartshore, head of General Steelwares, who claimed that he had purchased over 11 miles of steel. In 1907, Shannon Fraser was appointed by the receiver to supervise the settling of the old mill estates. With his wife Annie, the Frasers spent their first six years at Mowat leasing a 1.7 acre site that included the old hospital up on the hill above the old mill site. In 1913, they decided that the tourist trade had some promise. They sold the hospital lease site and acquired a lease that included the old mill hand kitchen and boarding house. This they turned into Camp Mowat. It was located at the southern edge of the chipyard, south of the mill site. The lodge was an immediate success, but was destroyed by fire in November of 1920, allegedly due to an overturned kerosene lamp or sparks from the fireplace. Annie and her daughter Mildred were away at the time, and little was salvaged except some livestock and fowl. Undeterred, the Frasers abandoned the site and moved to a little cottage near the lake. They leased land next to the old mill site and built a new Mowat Lodge. Their new Mowat Lodge was again an immediate success and survived until 1930, when once again it and the Frasers' little cottage next door burnt to the ground. The Frasers gave up and moved to Kearney. I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour of Canoe Lake and its many landmarks. For more stories and deeper historical insights, please feel free to check out my book, A Paddler's Guide to the Human History of Canoe Lake's Algonquin Park. It's available through the Friends of Algonquin Bookstore or through my website, algonquinpartheritage.com.